Thanks for watching my channel. I'll summarize the one four episodes of Shogun with reviews and introduce the latest five episodes. For those who are about to watch Shogun or want to deepen their understanding, please watch until the end. Now let's explain Shogun's background from a Japanese perspective in simple terms. Looking up Shogun from a historical drama standpoint, in Japanese production, we have Honnoji Incident, directed by Takeshi Kitano, which deals with the historical event in Japan. On the other hand, Shogun, produced by Hollywood, tells the story of the pivotal battle of Battle of Sekigahara, establishing itself as an authentic depiction of the Sengoku period produced overseas. The lead actor and producer Hiroki Sanada describes Shogun as a dream project to achieve a blend of Japanese and Western elements. Incidentally, the catchphrase for this work is Deceive Seas. The original work was written by James Clavell in 1975 under the title Shogun, and it was adapted into a live action drama in 1980, starring Toshiro Mifune from Japan. This drama was broadcast in both Japan and the United States, receiving acclaim overseas and winning Emmy and Golden Globe awards. When producing this drama, Hiroki Sanada gathered specialists in Japanese historical dramas from Japan and instructed to create a realistic work. Not just entertainment, Justin Marks, who was involved in the hit movie Top Gun Maverick, also participated in the uh, screenplay. Among the actors mainly active in Japan, Tokuma Nishioka and Fumi Nikaido participated. Recently, Sawai Anne who appeared in the latest Hollywood film, Godzilla, Monarch Legacy of Monsters as a parent child role, and Hira Takehiro, who appeared as the antagonist in this work, and also appeared in Gran Turismo, are also part of the cast. Now let's introduce the summaries of episodes 1 and 2 of Shogun. The era of Shogun is set in 1600, on the eve of the Battle of Sekigahara, its timer of chaos as power struggles erupt among the famous warlords known as the Five Elders, aiming to seize control following the death of the ruler. Toyotomi Hideyoshi, in the midst of this bureaucratic battle, Lord Ishido Kazunari plots the assassination of Lord Toranaga Yoshi, a powerful warlord in the Kanto region and a key player in diplomacy. Toranaga is uh, depicted as Tokugawa Ieyasu. Meanwhile, Lord Toranaga finds himself in a tight spot upon his arrival in Osaka. At the same time, a British ship aiming to seize the profits of the Juzit run Christianity in Japan wrecks and is destroyed. One of Toranaga's samurai, Miura Anjin, whose ship washes ashore on the lands of the uh, Kashiki clan, faces various challenges, including being captured, mistreated, and targeted by the Jujitsu missionaries. With the help of the Spanish Rodriguez, Anji manages to survive despite facing death multiple times. Despite narrowly escaping death, Anji finds himself in a precarious situation in a foreign land. As the Jujits plot to assassinate and execute Anjin, and Ishido's plans are thwarted by Kashiki Yabushige's machinations, the Christian daimyo Kiyama, influenced by the Jujits, starts to move furthermore. Upon arriving in Japan, Anjin continues to strategize and persuade Toranaga not to lose heart, recognizing that the enemy's enemy could be an ally. It's intriguing to see how Anjim, amidst all these challenges, will eventually become a samurai, serving Toranaga. At the center of their fate lies the mysterious Christian woman, Mariko Toda. In these first two episodes, as the untold sides of history and the grand schemes unfold, conspiracy and intrigue swirl setting the stage for the epic Sengoku spectacle drama with unexpected twists and turns. 
Let me talk about what I fell up until the second episode of Shogun. What you might eventually think Toranaga Yoshi is the main character after watching the final episode. So far, I felt that Miura Anji is the true protagonist of this drama. The attention to detail, such as their finely crafted sets and props, wouldn't be out of place even in Japanese period dramas. The depiction of the British ship was also incredibly well done. The characters, especially foreigners who interact with Japanese people frequently, speak fluent Japanese, while those with less involvement speak brokenly, showing a meticulous attention to detail throughout. I particularly appreciated their dedication to authenticity, like Mariko Toda's fluency in foreign languages, revealed to have learned English directly from missionaries over 14 years. This speaks to the thoroughness of the character backgrounds, the clashes between Japanese samurai and the Mura Anjin, each considering the other barbarians, were fascinating. It's easy to imagine how misunderstandings like this arise when cultures and languages are not understood. The character of Yabushige fits perfectly into the story of intrigue and conspiracy, displaying a two-faced nature that suits the tale. Despite his cunning demeanor, he occasionally shows a human side by impensibly risking his life in the face of slight provocations. He is the type to use his cunning, appearing subservient to power, yet also coming across as somewhat petty. Miura Anjin, being the vanguard of the British Empire's expansion, initially comes across as an antagonist to Japan. In the first episode, we see the Portuguese scheming to take advantage of Japan's riches, which adds to the anticipation of seeing how the villainous Miura Andy's mindset evolves and whether he will eventually become a samurai serving Toranaga Yoshi. Furthermore, Hiroki Sanada's portrayal of Toranaga Yoshi is simply mesmerizing. From the scene where he effortlessly defeats an opponent with a single strike to his falconry scenes, every movement exudes grace. The visual aesthetic is top notch, and the friction that arises from the uh, interaction between characters of different backgrounds adds an interesting dimension. The central axis of the story the Machiavellian struggle between Toranaga Yoshi and Ishido Kazunari after the death of the Taiko provides a solid foundation for a rich and engaging narrative, complemented by delicate visual cues and witty performances. Even in just the first two episodes, I feel like I'm indulging in a luxurious piece of art. The realistic portrayal of the single period, including the uh, depiction of violence and uh, intimate scenes, fully utilizes its R15 rating without being gratuitous. However, I couldn't help but feel that the Juzit missionaries were portrayed as overly powerful, considering this is a fiction written by Western authors. Some exaggeration may be present. In Japanese history education, we learn that Toyotomi Hiyoshi enacted the uh, Baron Edict to prevent the spread of Christianity, and this policy was also inherited by the Tokugawa shogunate. So the setting of Juzit influence extended even to samurai and the daimyo just before the Battle of Sekigahara might feel odd to many Japanese viewers. Also, with a total of 10 episodes, each about an hour long, the pacing of the show is deliberate and slow. For those expecting battles typical of Japanese period dramas, it might feel a bit lacking. The line from Toranaga Yoshi, I, for one, I'm not moved by beauty, hints at Tokugawa Ies's tendency to not favor beautiful women a detail that likely reached viewers worldwide through this drama. The character inspired by Toda Mariko, Garasha Hosokawa, 
who is also the daughter of Akechi Mitsuhide. Well, poignant. By the way, Akechi Mitsuhide is known for betraying and defeating the famous warlord Oda Nobunaga, a pivotal figure in Japanese history. Also, the drum inspired by the Toyotomi Hideyoshi saying, When a true general is gone, it will be a hundred years. Help us understand that the Toyotomi Hideyoshi managed to unify the country while maintaining the spirit and the temperament of a farmer, which is deeply moving. At that time, there were many samurai hungry for power aspiring to become shogun. And I think there were few warriors with the pure samurai spirit like Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Furthermore, watching Kusuki Yabushige's involvement in a physical relationship between a courtesan from Izu in Shizuoka Prefecture and Takemaru made me wonder if such interactions were common in Nera without adult videos. Mira Anji is also a tricky character for Japan as his determination to serve Toranaga Yoshi is not yet apparent and it's unclear whether Yabushige will ultimately side with Toranaga Yoshi or Ishido. His decision seems likely to have a significant impact on the outcome. The juicy plot to turn Japanese ruler into Christian daimyo adds another layer of intrigue beyond the simple power struggle between the Toranaga Yoshi and the Ishido Kazunari, leading up to the uh, Battle of Sekigahara. I'm curious to see how the three way relationship between Toranaga Yoshi and Ishido Kazunari and the Jujits unfolds. Even in terms of scene direction, there's a scene where Miura Anjin is being taken for execution, but it's uh, interrupted by a band of thieves attacking, reminiscent of a fallen samurai being attacked by ninjas as seen in Hollywood movies like The Last Samurai. However, due to the careful steering by Hiroki Sanada, who portrays Toranaga Yoshi, the scene takes a different direction. Next is the summary of episode 3, Yoshi Toranaga and the Mirror Anjin, having survived an assassination attempt, plan to escape from Osaka fearing imminent danger if they stay. The Toranaga faces a threat from Ishido Kazunari, while Mura is targeted by the Jujit faction. However, their adversaries are not united. Ishido Kazunari and the Christian daimyo Kiyama initiates a nighttime ambush on the group. Causing further confusion, Toranaga and his party are forced out of the palanquin, leading to even more chaos as Ishido's men try to apprehend them. In the midst of the turmoil, Toranaga and his group managed to escape to the sea. Thanks to Mariko's skill with the Naginata and the brave fight put up by Mariko's husband, Toda Buntaro. However, the sea was filled with countless Christian forces boats, blocking their escape route, putting Yoshi Toranaga and his allies in another tight spot. Yet, Miura Anji had not yet set sail. He makes an unexpected proposal to negotiate with the anchored black ship. Toranaga boards the black ship and offers a mutually beneficial deal to the merchant captain and the Jujit priests, securing their cooperation in breaking the sea blockade. This move successfully rattles the Christian forces whom they had previously seen as enemies, partnering with the forces they had deemed absolute foes was quite a surprising turn of events. However, in the end, the captain agreed to leave Miura Anji behind in Osaka in exchange for evidence of his wrongdoings handed over to Toranaga. As a result, Toranaga and his allies began their escape by piloting the small boats from the black ship. Knowing the being left behind in Osaka would mean death for Miura Anjin. Therefore, Miura Anjin, who hasn't lost his freedom yet, Toranaga and Miura Anjin successfully break through the sea blockade and escape from Osaka together. 
in Osaka Toronagazu Trusted Retainer, Toda Hiromatsu, informed the other elders of Toronagazu resignation from the position of Taiko, declaring their victory in the escape battle. Meanwhile, on board the ship bound for Kanto, Toranaga practically ignores the evidence of Mira Anjin's misdeeds provided by the Jujits and welcomes him as a Hatamoto, appointing him as a tactical advisor. As they start a showdown from the ship to the shore, the third episode comes to a close. It leaves us wondering if a reversal of fortune is about to begin. Now, on to the review of the fourth episode. At the beginning, we see Yoshi Toranaga warmly welcomed by a large group of soldiers upon his arrival in Azio District, Shizuka Prefecture. The scene was captivating, portraying realism consistently throughout. The attention to detail and the substantial production budget ensured minimal discrepancies or oddities. The subtle yet palpable sense of realism allows both Japanese and non-Japanese viewers to appreciate the costumes, props, and expressions with minimal discomfort. However, there's still a hint of Western flavor in the cinematography, atmosphere, and filters. As Sanada Hiroki mentioned, highlighting the perfect blend of East and West. This episode focuses on their escape from Osaka and Toranaga's return to his domain to prepare for the impending war. Despite being a preparatory episode, it's filled with engaging content, making it the highlight of the series. The episode excels in depicting cultural exchange, Japanese culture, various contrasts, the humanity and the lessons of the characters. The intense scenes is unique to the R15 rating. Any concerns lingering from the third episode were dispelled. Regarding cultural exchange, it was fascinating to see Toda Mariko serving as an explainer while introducing Japanese culture and language to Miura Anjim and observing how he applied what he learned in England back to Japan. The discussion about the siege of Malta, a pivotal battle that thwarted the mighty Ottoman Empire. In Japan, they initially lacked the skill to accurately aim cannons, but Mura Anjin's guidance improved their accuracy. The dialogue between Mura Anjin and Toda Mariko, comparing Osaka with England, and finding Commonalities within cultural differences was also intriguing. In depicting the landscapes of Japan, scenes from the village of Ajiro were particularly intriguing, and the kinds of food they consumed. It's fascinating to see even natto, beloved Japanese dish, making an appearance of India drama. The scene where Mura Anjin challenges natto was quite Endearing. Moving on to contrasts, characters like Yoshi Toranaga and Kusuki Yabushige advance with their own beliefs, yet exhibit a sense of enlightenment and surrender to fate. On the other hand, younger characters like Nagato and Omi have a sense of youthfulness, striving to handle everything on their own, both in a positive sense of youthfulness and recklessness that can disrupt situations. Nagato may have initially felt out of place compared to others, but in this episode, he finally harmonized with the story in a positive way, realizing that human beings have their limits and need to rely on others. While realizing this at the age of 17 might seem early, both Yoshi Toranaga and Kusuki Yabushige navigate situations with a sense of transience. In the third episode, Kusuki Yabushige even wrote a farewell letter. Comparing these two generations adds to interesting dynamic. Utilizing the nature of a drama, each character has their moments. One character I particularly admired in the fourth episode 
まず宇佐美富士 Who despite her tough and dark circumstances as Mira Anzi's legal wife diligently fulfills her role as a samurai woman she had moments where she looked cool beautiful or cute and she was wonderful overall moving on to the fourth episode it was filled with conversational scenes akin to daily life which really highlighted the strengths of the female characters Toda Mariko continues to shine as the interpreter, seeing the youthful energy and impulsive actions of Omi and Nagato was also interesting. In terms of lessons, the conversation between Yoshi Toranaga and Nagato was beautifully executed. It's realistic that Yoshi Toranaga's teachings don't quite resonate with the young Nagato. It's similar to how otherwise from adults to study hard doesn't always resonate with young people even today. Furthermore, I appreciated how they vividly depicted the people being blown away by the、uh, canon, making good use of the all 15 rating. This highlighted the sharpness of the statement. This is not how samurai fight. Additionally, the portrayal of the complex love affairs and the intimate scenes. Added another layer of the intrigue. While the love triangle involving Mira Anjin and their widows is not ideal, the fact that they are moved by Usami Fuji's memory makes it a compelling as a story. In this scenario, their pure love might actually belong to Toda Mariko's side. The complexity of the relationships created based on their positions was simply captivating. In summary, as a preparatory episode before the war begins, I thought it was a very high quality and quite enjoyable. In this episode, even though it's fiction, some viewers might find other to be unacceptable, so it's something to be aware of. While there is the concept of concubinage and may not necessarily align with modern ethical standards, It ultimately depends on the individual perspectives, so perhaps it's not worth worrying too much about. What are your thoughts? Also, addressing concerns some people may have about Disney lately, I personally believe that this series doesn't fall into what's commonly referred to as bad political correctness. Compared to the 1980 version, Where certain aspects might seem inappropriate by today's standards, or where Japanese culture might have been misrepresented, this adaptation has been carefully reworked. This is something you'd understand better if you've seen the 1980 version of Shogun. I think Sanada Hiroki's performance plays a huge role in this. However, I have no intention of imposing anyone's beliefs or values. While Shogun sparked discussions about Asians during the Academy Awards in terms of the commercial viability, I believe that such productions in the long run contribute to the advancement of Asians. I have no intention of dismissing those who choose not to watch just because it's Disney. However, I do feel a sense of pride in seeing Sarada Hiroki succeed in Hollywood. And wanting many people to recognize the、uh, achievements he has undoubtedly earned. In the previous episode, watching the escape scene from the、uh, basket, I felt a bit、uh, uneasy about the script, but I think I actually prefer the 1980 version. The 80s version had a comedic tone to its portrayal, which made me laugh. So, I understand that the serious atmosphere of this series wouldn't fit the original tone, and I'm okay with the changes made. Like in this episode, actually, this series has quite a few changes from the 1980 version, and I was worried that the knowing the past versions might diminish the excitement. But with such significant changes, not knowing what's coming next and enjoying the differences. Kept it just as exciting. At this point, I just want Usami Fuji to be happy, losing her husband and son unjustly, without a place to die, and now having to endure being Mura Anji's legal wife. 
while keeping a strong front. Seeing Mira Anjin and Toda Mariko's rough affair starting, it's heartbreaking to watch, but I think that's what makes their romantic elements so interesting. In content like this, where extreme situations persist, I think it's one of the important elements to feel the sorrow and the human instincts. The duplicity of Kusuki Yabushige, the schemes of Omi, the desperate actions of Nagato to prove himself and gain his father's approval. They are all survival behaviors, and seeing everyone desperately striving to survive was really captivating. The irony of Mira Anjin's success in proving the soldier's accuracy in directly fueling Nagato's rampage was also intriguing. Just when they've successfully escaped from Osaka and started preparing for what to come under Yabushige's guidance, Nagato's removal of Ishido Kazunari's subordinates suddenly changes the situation drastically. And it's exciting to see what will happen next. Yabushige's subtle expression and Omi's delight in the background of this reality were pleasantly amusing. Now let's talk about the summary of episode 4. Mira Anji and Yoshi Toranaga's group successfully escaped Osaka and arrived at Ajiro in Shizuka Prefecture, where they are welcomed by the Lord Yabushige. However, Toranaga decides to take further action and returns to the sea. Meanwhile, Mira Anji stays in Ajiro to train the soldiers following Toranaga's wishes. Fuji, who has just lost her husband and son, becomes Toranaga's legal wife and they start living together. Along with Mariko, episode 4 mainly focuses on deepening relationships between characters, revealing their charms and motives so the story doesn't progress much. However, it's recommended because lesser known characters like Fuji and Nagato shine while training shoulders Yabushige. Mira Anjin successfully teaches British style artillery techniques, significantly improving the cannon's accuracy. At the same time, he strengthens his bond with Fuji and finally spends the night with Mariko. Mariko neither becoming a concubine nor herself turns into a mysterious figure after last night, as she claims it was a courtesan sent with Fuji's consent. Then in a cruel twist, Nagato, fueled by dissatisfaction and influenced by Omi, suddenly attacks Josen, Ishido's subordinate with the newly learned artillery techniques. Disregarding Yabushige's dismay, Nagato mercilessly kills the injured Jozen, claiming this is not the way of the samurai. Seeing this, Mariko senses the impending war, and episode 4 concludes, despite being told to wait until the enemy fails, Nagato's actions have once again put the Yoshi family in a dire situation. The tension has escalated dramatically. Now on to the fifth installment. It was quite captivating with the handling of the pheasant, cultural gaps, and the tense probing among various factions, particularly the scenes depicting the large army and the earthquakes were visually powerful, offering dynamic excitement. Dialogue scenes like the usual confrontations between Yoshi Toranaga and Yabushige where Yabushige always seemed to dance to Toranaga's tune, were even somewhat endearing. This episode really showcased the strength of Toranaga and Nagato, Mira Anji's efforts to adapt to Japanese culture, amidst encounters with the behavior he doesn't understand gradually became quite endearing. Speaking of endearing, Nagato Ishii also grew stronger in his determination to earn his father's approval. Watching Nagato's growth is another intriguing aspect of this series. The fifth episode brings us a heated debate between Ishido and Kiyama regarding Yoshi Toranaga's successor at the Osaka Council of Elders. Moreover, the spotlight is overwhelmingly on the female characters. 
while Fuji's reputation grows in the fourth episode, the enigmatic machinations of Ochiba no Kata, who reappeared in the fifth episode, were quite captivating. Despite the absence of prominent battle scenes, the adept portrayal of characters, personalities, and the intricate relationships made it enjoyable. One notable aspect is the comparatively slow tempo of the original series, which is also a strength of the 1980 version. However, compared to that, this version has added more peaks and valleys, resulting in a faster pace. It's a drama suitable for both leisurely and dynamic enjoyment. The confrontation between Miura Anji and Toda Buntaro at the banquet was both heartwarming and poignant. The samurai pride adds complexity to the conversation, particularly from Buntaro's side. While this scene was also presented in the 1980 version, overall, this version has a more serious tone. Even Miura Anji's reactions have been adjusted to fit modern sensitivities. This series truly strikes a balance well. The differences in how Miura Anji and Toda Mariko perceive freedom and human dignity highlight that these are subjective and unresolved issues for each individual. Through Miura Anji's perspective, we also see the Japanese view of life and death. It's truly heartbreaking that despite not harboring hatred towards Toda Buntaro, he still seeks revenge. Yet for Toda Mariko to live as an individual, the barriers were too great in the isolationist Japan of that era. This was embodied by Kiji Miura Anjin trying to adapt British customs in Japan, caused discomfort, even casualties. Feeling outraged at the country's disregard for life and wanting to leave Japan. Quite ironic for a future citizen of the British Empire. While acknowledging that people live in a collective society, Mira Anji shows resilience by trying to adapt. When hosting Toda Buntaro, he attempted to serve his country's stew. I thought someone could have tried it. Since Miura Anji ate natto, that's where you can't help but find Miura Anji endearing. The same goes for Yoshi Nagato going down to the landslide with Miura Anji to rescue Yoshi Toranaga is quite touching. It shows his deep love for his father, the sense of concern for the children, the ominous figure plotting against Yoshi Toranaga adds to the intrigue. Compared to the 1980 version, there are fewer appearances of the、uh, Juzi side in this version, but there's a greater focus on Japanese characters. Let's look forward to the future of characters like Usami Fuji, Yoshi Nagato, Toda Buntaro, Omi, who were not present in previous works. There's a sense that the ending of this version might take a different turn. So, what do you think? Shogun continues. Now we are eager to see how it unfolds. Okay, don't forget to subscribe to Chuck's Japan's channel, where we explain Japanese history in an easy to understand way. Check out our video summarizing Japanese reviews of Shogun as well. Chuck's.